This program is brought to you by Emory University. We're very lucky to have our next speaker, Professor Michael Newton. Professor Newton is a professor of law at Vanderbilt University and has previously served in the Department of Law at the U.S. Military Academy. He's published in journals and newspapers as varied as the New York Times, the Stanford Journal of International Law, the Military Law Review, and the Virginia Journal of International Law. When we were researching some of our topics today, um, we were looking to put together a panel. And the first two articles we found were both written by Professor Newton. So we knew he would be one of them. And then we found a third article and as it turns out, it was a response to Professor Newton. So we decided to invite him here to give a lecture today um, on a specific topic, and we're very excited to have him here. So please join me in welcoming Professor Newton. I feel welcomed, if, not, if for no other reason than the fact that you all came back in after lunch and you didn't go find something else to do. So here we are in the coveted post-lunch session. Um, there's a lot of talent and a lot of expertise here. Uh, as you might have heard if you listened to any of the lunchtime discussions. So my job is to A, keep you awake, uh, or at least attempt to do so, but B, tee up some conversation. And, and really what I really want to do uh, is to fill up some of the gaps and, and of, of earlier discussions and then tee up and leave a good amount of time, uh, I'm hoping about 15, we got started a little late, maybe 15 minutes or so for a good dialogue. Uh, so that's my goal. If you're, if you're here, uh, also my, my, my sort of critical goal is to give you three life lessons. So listen carefully. You get three big life lessons drawn from this history. So, so structure, just a little bit of history. Uh, I want to get into some depth on the statutory structure. You heard the earlier mention of the American Service Members Protection Act. Um, just by sheer coincidence, I was the uh, executive branch official nego negotiating with Congress on ASPA. So I really want to sort of fill in some of the gap because ASPA sets the necessary predicate that you have to understand. What we really are going to do in this session after lunch is focus on what we, what we can and should be doing going forward. What's the prognosis? What's the future look like? Um, in that vein, I can also say some things that Ambassador Rapp didn't say start or couldn't say, starting with this. The reality is that we look at the magnitude of the challenges in this field. These are hugely complicated cases. They're, they're dramatic uh, trials. They're, there's enormous amounts of human suffering. The magnitude of the challenge is extraordinary. Uh, and Ambassador Rapp in here, otherwise I'd embarrass him. You should be very proud of what he does for you in the diplomatic circles. Uh, both the reputation, the gravitas, the sense of humor, the, the diplomatic aplomb. He is, the I, I think, right now for this time and period, the perfect face of U.S. diplomacy on these issues to the world. So you really are very fortunate to have had him here today, talk to him, pick his brain. What he can't say is that, you know, we focus on the external challenges, the challenges facing the court and the, the, the enormous complexity of these situations, whether we're talking about Syria or Lebanon or any of the other variety of situations. What he can't say is that one of the other huge challenges that he faces is the monstrosity of our own bureaucracy. You know, never forget the, the, the bureaucratic hurdles and the bureaucratic challenges of our own interagency process. So it's a, if, if, if you want to put it in military parlance, it's a two-front war. Both externally, there's a huge array of challenges, and internally, there's a vast array of very different interagency challenges. And if you're looking for a great research topic or a great note topic, there's the first one I will have given you. Um, so a little bit of history. Uh, most of you, I mean, show of hands, how many folks have really dug around the Rome statue and really spent time digging in the statue? I know, of course, John Washburn, yes, of course. Um, it, is, it is perhaps, with, with a poss couple of possible exceptions, one of the most complicated interconnected treaties in the world. And, and simply one of my sound bites on this is that it really represents um, I think a changing ground norm. There's been a lot of talk about was it a Groshen moment? It was in some ways, but my soundbite is that it's, it's the high water mark for what we would call myopic multilateralism, right? For, ever since Nuremberg, there's the entire trend moving towards this epical development, the creation of a permanent international criminal court. The articles in this vein began in 1945 and 1946 as a reaction to Nuremberg. 
We can't have the ad hocery. We can't have the victor's justice. We need a permanent process. And so by the time you get to the very last days of Rome, it's no overstatement to say that you really are capping off at that point nearly a half century of development. And that's an important insight because it explains a lot of what happened coming out of Rome. And more importantly, um, it, it helps, helps you to understand exactly where we are today as we try to move forward into the second decade of the court. Remember that prior to that, and this has been mentioned, you had American leadership in establishing Nuremberg. You had American leadership uh, in, in the, the overlooked trials of that era, the tribunals in the Far East, right? B-29, American B-29 plane loads of paper being flown out to Tokyo to do those trials under the, under the occupation authority of Douglas MacArthur. Huge amounts of work. In the early days of the ICTY, uh, there's a cadre of American expertise who are friends of all of ours now. They were generally provided in the very early days, never mind the fact that the political support and the political vision for the ICTY came from American diplomacy, the Arms Export and Control Act provision that allows us to, to lend expertise, experts from uh, the Drawdown Authority, the Arms Export and Control Act, provided us people like Brenda Hollis, people like Mike Keegan, American military experts, the next day right there, and then followed Justice Department people. So that cadre of expertise was instrumental in the early days of the ICTY, probably the first two years, okay? ICTR, very similar story. The other thing that happened in that time period was the intelligence provision process using Rule 70. We have this very elaborate structure which still exists today in the context of the ad hoc tribunals. Uh, for providing Rule 70 materials. And Rule 70 simply says that we can take from our vast collection archives and uh, the, the vast uh, information in the U.S. government processes, we can take that, we can provide it to the tribunals on a lead and background basis. We can help them out. And then, of course, as, as any good prosecutor would do, there's pieces of that that you say, well, yes, the lead and background was very, all very nice, but I really need and just one of hundreds examples of examples I could give you, we really need General Wesley Clark to talk and to testify in the Milosevic case. So what that did was provide the portal through which actual trial evidence came, okay? And, and whether you're talking about imagery in the case of the Srebrenica trials, here's the imagery of the mass graves. Here's the before, here's the after. That's American satellite imagery, declassified. This very elaborate process and I would say, um, this is why I make reference as I began to the monstrosity of our own bureaucracy. We've never been able to do this expeditiously. We've never been able to do it cleanly. Uh, anybody who's been in this field inside the U.S. government will show you the scars on their back from those bureaucratic fights. And yet, we've done it enormously effectively in that, in that context. And that process continues to, to work very, very well today. The, the analog in the Rome Statute is Article 72, written and drafted by Americans. Um, in, in, in my course, as I teach the Rome Statute in detail, uh, I, I ask students very frequently in the Rome Statute to go along and draw a little American flag in the margins. There are many of the provisions of the Rome Statute that, that were led by the U.S. diplomatic efforts, and Article 72 is one of them, patterned after this model that worked so successfully in the ad hoc tribunal process. Um, now, why is that important? These two trends collide in the run-up to Rome, right? There's, there's the American sense that we truly are the leaders in this field, both intellectually and that we've, we've really driven this process forward, collides with a whole variety of competing factors in Rome, one of which is the rise of the third world, one of which we were talking about at lunch, the sense of, of Africans. The Rwandans came to the UN and said, you abandoned us in Rwanda. We need a permanent institutional structure with an independent proprio motu prosecutor that can come to our aid when the UN is powerless and ineffective and frozen in indecision. We need that, we demand that. Uh, the Germans, of course, who, who we all know were very instrumental in the like-minded process, looked at their own history and said, we've now come full circle. We're going to lead the diplomatic effort in many ways to help create the permanent international structure. 
that, that, that collided um, with our own uh, treaty ineptness. You know, we talk about um, so many treaties, the Law of the Sea Convention, Protocol 1, Protocol 2, so many, 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 many treaties hung up in the U.S. bureaucratic constitutional process for ratifying treaties. The Rome process, in effect, demonstrates the inadequacy, the gap in our own constitutional process. When the U.S. delegation says, with perfectly good intent, work with us, help us to get something that we can, in fact, take back and get ratified, the rest of the world, for very good reason, says, you can't get it ratified anyway when the U.S. delegation comes back and says, hey, we have a concrete proposal that will help us gain domestic traction, the rest of the world says, we tried that in the law of the sea. We gave you exactly what you wanted. Where's your ratification documents? Nowhere to be seen. So you have this collision in Rome of all of these factors. And I dare say, for those who are in this field, uh, if there's another moment like it in all of diplomatic history, I'm not aware of it. Where, where at the very end of the negotiations, after 50 plus years of momentum and all these divergent streams of international development that have come together, when the United States simply says, correctly, mind you, this treaty text was actually put together by the Secretariat in the middle of the night from a composite of a set of negotiations, many of which had not even been negotiated or agreed upon the floor, we think it very important to take this back to capitals and read it and think about it and then reconvene at some future point where we really can have national consensus. And you all know the history. Many, many countries voted for the text of the Rome Statute having never read the full treaty. So now today, us academics get to say, well, how does Article 30 fit with Article 20? we got to work it out because we didn't take the time then to do it. The other thing that happened at the very end of Rome that's unprecedented as far as I know in, Amer in, in world diplomatic history is the idea that, that when the U.S. delegation lost that vote and walked out, there was this eruption of momentum. Right? People cheered and they cried and they, this, this huge thing really truly directed at the United States of America who along with our good friends, you know, our good dear friends around the world couldn't support the Rome statute, but like Iran. Now, why is that important? It's all ancient history. I think, you know, some of you, I was teaching the other day about something from the Gulf War, and one of my students said, why don't I remember this? And then we did the math, and because you were in like second grade. It's ancient history. But, life lesson number one, if you focus on the particular problem, and ignore the context, you're never getting to the root problem. If you ignore the diplomatic history here and try to simply address today, what does the United States do with the court and ignore the history, ignore all of that, you can't really solve the problem. And I, and I want to emphasize to you, this problem is on both sides. So the, uh, my good friend Charles mentioned earlier uh, the unsigning letter in the Bush administration. Really all that statement is, it says the United States does not have any legal obligation to maintain the object and purpose of the Rome Statute. And everybody says that's because the U.S. is trying to kill the court. Uh, in fact, from the Bush administration perspective, they said, follow the logic. We're doing what Article 98 allows us to do. How can you possibly argue that doing what the treaty says is violating the object and purpose of the treaty? We're actually complying with the treaty. The history explains this vastly, radically different set of perspectives. Now, what came out of Rome, as I said, was a, was a watershed. It was a, designed to create a synergy of systems. And, and there's been a, uh, Diane and I were talking earlier, there's been a flood of conferences celebrating the 10-year anniversary, looking at the lessons. One of the things that's very clear from the first decade is that this model of a cooperative synergy between the court working with, communicating with, uh, this, this creation of a holistic system in some sense is not nearly where people thought it would be. We're way behind the creation of this cooperative system and all the rhetoric of truly ending impunity. We're way behind where people thought we would be. That's the first truism. The second thing is that these cases have proven to be much harder 
than people thought. People thought, well, we've got a proprio motu prosecutor, cases will move. Uh, the process in the Rome Statute is so structured and so complex and so sophisticated that all the improvements and all the lessons learned in some sense have fallen by the wayside. So we're going to charge a single, very narrow charge, set of charges in Lubanga, and it's still going to take more than a decade. There's, there's structural, systematic problems here. Um, now, that history explains much about where ASPA actually came from, the American Service Members Protection Act. As the statute came into force, a first-term Bush administration was faced with this problem. What do we do about the fact that even President Clinton, in his own signing statement, said, as he's sending this, the, the Rome Statute to the Senate, I believe this treaty is fundamentally flawed. There are fundamental problems to be corrected here but I support the overall object and purpose. What does the Bush administration do about that? They, they, they came out with a statement. Uh, if you go back and read the statement, the Grossman speech, which I can send you or you can Google it and find it, it's actually a very moderate statement. Despite all the heated rhetoric at the time, the speech itself is actually pretty moderate. It says, the soundbite is, we respect the right of those states that want to ratify the treaty. We ask them, in converse, to respect our right not to join the treaty. It's pretty moderate. And then it goes on to, um, to set out, if I can find it here, the core purposes. Now, we could all vote on these. We could have various opinions. The only one that truly would matter would be Ambassador Rapps. But here's the U.S. diplomatic position as at that time. We want to continue to play a leadership role in righting these wrongs. Uh, we want to discipline the armed forces of the United States. We want to have a f policy that, we may, that our conduct overseas will re re remain completely consistent with those norms. We will support politically, financially, technically, and this is the one I want you to focus on because I think this is the one, in my view, where we've fallen the furthest short. Remember, this is May of 2002. We will support politically, financially, technically, and logistically any post-conflict state that seeks to credibly pursue domestic humanitarian law. Now that on its face is a promise to build the kind of holistic system that the Rome structure envisions. The, the court sits at the very apex of this integrated system. States around the world have the vast majority of the cases, the, uh, in sheer numerical terms, thousands and thousands more cases prosecuted at the domestic level. Um, it was in that context that I think the Bush administration made perhaps the most egregious mistake of that era. And it was the decision that it took the election of, uh, of President Obama to correct. And that was the decision to stop attending the Assembly of States parties. That was the decision when the Bush administration stopped attending the Assembly of States parties. It meant that we didn't have a voice, that we weren't there to participate, that we weren't there uh, to talk just about perceptions, because all this is based on this gulf of perceptions, okay? I think that was a critical mistake. So life lesson number one, if you don't begin to negotiate with the end in mind, you'll never get there. There was never ever in U.S. diplomacy, either in the Clinton administration or the Bush administration, a pathway, a viable pathway with interagency clearance to getting to the point that the U.S. could accept the Rome Statute. The, the statements all along, even from President Clinton, are we still believe this treaty is fundamentally flawed. Okay? And to this day, I'm not aware of a viable mechanism in negotiations between the United States and its allies to say, how do we take the Rome Statute as it currently exists after a decade of practice and move it into a place where the United States can wholeheartedly submit it to the Senate for advice and consent and lend every ounce of executive political support to ratifying this treaty. We're not there. So what that means is, and I really mean this, that the United States relationship with the court is defined by and limited by the support that we can give. That's why we really have to focus on what can we constructively do. Now, the primary barrier from that comes from the American Service Members Protection Act. Uh, which, as Ambassador Rapp noted, created statutory constraints. You talk about stupid. I mean, don't YouTube that. 
don't Twitter that, but you talk about shooting yourselves in the foot. The very first rumblings from ASPA came from the U.S. military in the South Com region in Central and South America. When U.S. military leaders came back and said, hey, wait a minute, we're statutorily constrained from helping our friends and allies. And guess who's filling that gap? The Chinese. This statute is undercutting our core strategic interests. That's a problem. And there was this huge back and forth dialogue to correct that. I want to read you the statutory language because this is important. We've referred to it, but I want, to, I want to read it to you word for word. And then I want to read you from the executive history or from the legislative history because it's my premise that this language gives us far more latitude and far more freedom than our Department of Justice is currently allowed by policy to do. Listen to this language. Nothing in this chapter shall prohibit the United States from rendering assistance to international efforts to bring justice to Osama bin Laden, or Saddam Hussein, Slobodan Milosevic, Osama bin Laden, other members of Al Qaeda, leaders of Islamic Jihad, and here's the key phrase, other foreign nationals accused of genocide, war crimes, or serious crimes against humanity. Now, here's, here's the key things you need to understand about that provision. It was introduced by Senator Dodd. It, it had very strong support in the end. It's specifically intended to focus on U.S. support to the ICC. You know that for three reasons. One, because the phrase other was taken out. It, in the original language, there was efforts on the floor to, to make it say this. Nothing in this subchapter shall prohibit the United States from rendering assistance to other international efforts, referring not to the ICC, but to other, perhaps regional bodies or ad hoc bodies, like we, uh, hybrid bodies like what we did in Sierra Leone. That word was taken out. It didn't make it into the language. If there's any doubt about that, Senator Leahy stood up on the floor, and he said on the floor, when Senator Dodd and I were drafting this amendment, I specifically added the phrase and other foreign nationals accused of genocide, crimes against humanity, to ensure that this section would apply to the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court currently has jurisdiction over these crimes, and the legislative history is very clear that where the court is, is proceeding against American nationals, we have a strategic problem, we've got a problem we're going to address. And I agree with Ambassador Rapp that our complementarity structure is on a par with anybody in the world. It's not a serious problem if complementarity is kept is taken seriously. But it is a huge perception problem. That provision is intentionally drafted to allow the United States to assist the court in any action involving a non-American, any non-American. And if there's any doubt about that, Senator Leahy goes on to say, very pointedly, my amendment merely says that despite whatever else we have said, when it comes to prosecuting these people, we would, quote, participate and help, even though we are not a signatory or a participant in the International Criminal Court. And it was sort of wrong as a, as a lawyerly matter on the signatory part. But you get the point. That provision is essentially a carte blanche uh, trap door in uh, the American Service Members Protection Act. Here's your second life lesson, though. Avoid ludicrous, ludicrous expressions of legislative peak. It's not what you say so often as how you say it. Okay? How was your day, honey? Fine. How was work? Fine. Would you like to talk about it? No. Very different than how was work. Oh, it was a good day. It was fine. No big deal. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. What people remember the American Service Members Protection Act for is this ridiculous provision that says the United States reserves the right to invade the Hague or use military force to go, we call it the, you know, ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous, both as a matter of international law and domestic law. But that's what people remember that act for, the bomb the Hague provision. It's, an, it's a national embarrassment that that's in U.S. statutory structure. And yet it's still there. You see, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. The effect of that clause was to displace good faith dialogue, good faith dialogue on what the Rome Statute actually says. How do we make complementarity work effectively? Okay? 
How do we take the Dodd provision and use it, even from day one, to constructively work with the court where it serves U.S. interests? All of that was lost in this very partisan uh, rancor. To that extent, I would refer you to uh, uh, Sec uh, Harold Coe's statement, which is the perfect soundbite for the change in U.S. policy. Here it is in one sentence from the Kampala conference. The United States comes to this conference with, by the way, the largest delegation by far, and people listen to us. They want to hear what we say on everything. We come to this conference in the spirit of renewed engagement, true, remembering, of course, the Bush policy not to even participate with the Assembly of States parties, with the aims, here's the key, of supporting a constructive outcome that is based on, what, another vote where we sort of get booed out of the room and people stomp and cheer and laugh at us as we leave? No, that is based on consensus. We want to work with you to find consensus. That's critically important. And in this vein, one more point of history, and then I'll tell you why we still care. Uh, before the Bush policy came out, before the Rome Statute entered into force, before the Assembly of States parties ever really formally began, there was a whole series of about two years of negotiations where after the statute, but before it came into force, uh, there was debate over the elements of crimes and the rules of procedure. The U.S. was a critical player in those negotiations. People like Sarah Criscatelli, who just left the court, critical from our own Department of Justice, critical expertise. Okay? And I will tell you this, truthfully, the elements of crimes negotiations, I was there, I was in the room, were joined by consensus to include the United States and China and India and Russia and Syria and Iraq and everybody else. The elements of crimes are based on consensus. Now why does that matter? Because, remember, this is supposed to be an integrated, holistic, homogenous system of international justice and countries that that now ratify the treaty can take, and by the way, countries that don't ratify the treaty, can take those consensus-based elements and build them into their own domestic statutes and be on a par with every country in the world. When I sit down in Baghdad to talk to Iraqis about how to prosecute Ba'athist leaders, I pull out the official authoritative Arabic version of the elements of crimes. I say, here's the international standard agreed to by consensus by every NATO ally. Do this and you're guaranteed on these very complicated crimes, all the actus reus, all the mens rea, et cetera. Now, why do we care going forward? Because today, I would tell you and I can give you examples that there's a huge amount of U.S. military equity built into keeping the integrity of that body of law intact that we join by consensus along with everybody else in the world. There's a lot of factors around the world that would like to undermine that body of law, that would like to tease out strands and change it in ways that suit their own personal interests. I will guarantee you, you can take it to the bank, that the very strong interests of the U.S. military are in keeping that document and those elements, that substantive understanding of the law, intact very critically important in U.S. interests. The other piece that's why it's in our interest is, is what I call coalition unity. Um, there's a chapter in my, my, my forthcoming book uh, on the Polish uh, massacre at Nanger Kell, and it, it's a very complicated situation. I don't have time to tell you, but what I do have time to tell you is this was the first time since World War II that Polish military officials were prosecuted for alleged war crimes. It caused a huge disruption in the Polish popular consciousness. The leader of the Poles, uh, the, the, the military NATO leader in ISAF said, because those Polish soldiers were under the operational control of an American commander, our posture towards the ICC caused him to say, Ignore the Americans. They don't, they don't have anything to do with international law or the respect for these norms. Now, that's wrong on the substance, you see. But our posture towards the court has allowed that posture. So, so in a way, it undermines our coalition unity. And then the last thing, and I think this is critically important, it's in the Bush administration policy in 2002. Ambassador Rapp has said it probably hundreds of times at this point. Harold Coe has said it. 
The President has said it in the National Security Strategy. Our job in this field is to lead. I don't know about you, but I went, when I went to grammar school, to lead is a verb. It is our job to lead, to shape the world in respect for these body of, this body of law and these norms, but also in the enforcement. Which then leads to the logical question, in light of ASPA, what can we do? Never let it be forgotten. We can, we can brag and we can feel very good about the fact that every single ICTY indictee is in custody and a lot of other examples from the ICTR context that we don't have time to talk about. None of that happens, I can guarantee you this, without the political, economic, intelligence, and diplomatic determination of the United States. When the, when the European Union gets weak knees in the carriages case, over and over and over again, it's U.S. diplomats helping to stiffen that resolve. That's why Carriage goes into custody. That's why Milosevic goes into custody. That's not all. But that's a key part of it. It's U.S. economic intelligence and diplomatic diligence that's the critical cornerstone in making this field work effectively. For example, if in the context of Sudan or Libya, we're going to stop the French from, from vetoing a Security Council resolution and therefore you get a 13B referral, does it just stop there? Does the United States say, well, hey, we did our part. We didn't, you know, we facilitated a Security Council resolution and a referral to the court. That's it. We're done. We've done our part. No. Because we all know what happens after the fact. Not much. Here's the five key things I think that we can do. Number one, I think we need, in keeping with the spirit of the Dodd Amendment, a specific executive and legislative uh, opinion that makes it very clear that in the context of a Chapter 7, Article 13b referral, that that is the functional equivalent of an ASPA waiver. It needs to be explicit. Where the United States has supported uh, a Chapter 7 referral to the ICC, we can fully support that prosecution to the same extent as we would have been able to do in the ICTY and the ICTR. Why? Because it's exactly the same analytical analog. It's exactly the same. So if we're talking about the provision of expertise, if we're talking about drawdown authority, if we're talking about intelligence, et cetera. Now, this is important, I think, from the standpoint of what can we do. It's even more important, as I said a while ago, Ambassador Rapp and his office has a huge struggle dealing with the bureaucratic machinery of the U.S. government and our own U.S. bureaucracy. That clear statement of policy filters down throughout DOD, throughout the Defense Intelligence Agency, throughout all of this welter of interagency places, that's a critical piece of our policy going forward, and I'll say it again. Uh, uh, U.S. support for a Chapter 7 referral to the court using Article 13b is the functional equivalent of an ASPA waiver in every sense of the word. And from that moment on, where there's a Chapter 7 referral, full up, above board, full press support to the court is in keeping with U.S. strategic interests. Second issue, I think we need in that same kind of effort to have clear timelines for the community. One of the problems that we've always had in the ICTY and the ICTR context, we created the structure in the statute in Rule 72 to do many of those same kinds of processes. But what frequently happens is you get slow rolled in the bureaucracy. I think we need an executive order that says where the ICC submits a valid uh, request for assistance, the U.S. government will respond in and pick a time frame, 30 days, 45 days, clear guidelines, clear expectations. And again, that helps shape the perception outwardly. And more importantly, it helps rope in the cats of our own bureaucracy and the bureaucratic obstructionists who, who for various reasons, many, 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 many of which are very strong, have their own reasons for resisting support to the court. It says, by virtue of executive order, you've got 30 days to respond. And, and here's a clear process, both externally and internally. Number three, even keeping with the language of ASPA, there's a huge array of pragmatic things we can do. And I think of the US, US flying Charles Taylor to The Hague, for example. I think of uh, security for, you, uh, for ICC inspectors going into Darfur. I think of 
and American military commanders will always say, this is not my job, I have plenty of other things to do. The problem with that, of course, being you're in a chain of command. When the president and the commander in chief dictates that this be done, you're going to find the resources to do it. Whether you're talking about transporting indictees, whether you're talking about uh, arresting Joseph Coney as one potential example, whether you're talking about um, facilitating, let's say the Australians want to facilitate forensic work in, uh, in Darfur. The diplomatic muscle to help them get in and the Department of Defense expertise to help them get in and to protect them. There's a huge array of things we can do practically to help with that. The fourth point is related, forensic support. We need a much clearer mechanism to provide forensic support in the field. Some of the best forensic support in all the world was done by U.S. intelligence people in Iraq. And that built on the experiences and the lessons learned from the Balkans. All the Srebrenica imagery, uh, all the, and the, the Srebrenica uh, uh, mass grave exhumations, all of the use of that trial evidence. We used it successfully in the Onfall genocide case. We used it successfully into jail. Uh, read my book on the Saddam trial. I got uh, from the intelligence agency this beautiful before and after picture that was actually trial testimony in the DeJail trial. Here's DeJail, this wonderful lush uh, date palm groves, this lush agricultural area. They made Saddam angry and they literally went back to medieval times, plowed it, salted it, and there's this huge dry patch, crime against humanity of inhumane acts where Saddam punished that town. That was 1983. They then took exactly the same methodology and employed it in the north against the Kurds. That satellite imagery came from the United States of America. And the forensics expertise to document and supplement the eyewitness testimony came from the United States of America. There's no reason in the world why we can't provide the exact same support either ourselves or facilitate other nations that are willing to provide that same support. And then lastly, this was mentioned earlier, uh, the, the extension of the Rewards for Justice program. We've learned that it's one thing to have rewards statutorily authorized. It's a whole different, to mix metaphors, uh, zebra of a different color, to actually have that implemented within the bureaucratic structure of the U.S. government. We need clear executive language that says, we will handle this, and it will be done, or at least decisions will be made using this process on this timeline. It's a critical gap. It's one thing to have the legislation uh, that, that, that gives us that capacity. There's a huge array of legislative and bureaucratic hurdles that will take place in the interim. And I think we owe it to the world and we owe it to the court to say, yes, we have this capacity. Here is the process. Here are the timelines. Let's be very clear and forthright. And again, you see the theme, third life lesson, be pragmatic, solve the problem. Don't talk about the problem, don't whine about the problem, get to the real problem and solve it. And so, so having statutory authority to provide rewards is a good thing, but many times our legislators then say, oh, we've done our part, we haven't appropriated anything, what we need are multi-year appropriations that don't expire, and, and clean legislative authority for clean timelines and clean bureaucratic hurdles to eliminate that, the obstacles to that so that we can actually make decisions. And importantly, decisions that can be communicated to the court because it's all about communication. I want to leave you with Ambassador Rapp's words from, from, his, uh, from his intervention in, in Kampala. This is exactly what he said, and I quote, and then we've got time for questions. The end of impunity and the promotion of justice are not just moral imperatives, they're stabilizing forces in international affairs. And there he's quoting from the National Security Strategy. Our National Security Strategy recognizes, and I quote again, those who intentionally target innocent civilians must be held accountable, and we will continue to support institutions and prosecutions that advance this important interest. That's the right promise, it's the right spirit, it's the right leadership. That's what Mark Grossman said in May of 2002, that we spent a full decade saying it but not doing it. And it's now we have the pathway and the renewed cooperative engagement to fulfill that promise. And, and that's, that's all I'd say. All right, what questions do you all have?
Thank you, Mike. Um, my question is one of more in, internal focus. Part of the subtext, both of your presentation and um, Ambassador Rapp's presentation, is the U.S. is not going to join the ICC. Um, we've talked a lot about how to support the ICC, notwithstanding that presumed fact. But I wonder if there might not be some discussion of how there might be domestic acculturation to work against resignation to that. Um, and related to that, and one of the reasons that I think about that is it seems to me there are ways that the absence of Americans within the structure of the ICC has not served the ICC. And obviously, we all come from our own perspective, but I think about things like the witness-proofing rule in the ICC, which says that to engage in witness preparation that most of us who have been practitioners in the states would consider our ethical responsibility is itself unethical. Um, that's just one example of a number of places where, uh, well, and the other one would be differing views of what the standard of beyond reasonable doubt means. Um, I think that, that the inquisitorial standard may be a bit more stringent than the American standard. Not to say either one is right, but there's been a huge vacuum in which the American ideals of how criminal justice have done simply haven't had a place at the table because we're not members and we can't participate in that way. No, that's, uh, that's right. Um, although I think sometimes we, and this is why I think the history of the ICTY, ICTR is kind of relevant. Those were very unique circumstances. The, 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 the diplomatic process that led to the Rome Statute, by definition, meant even if we had joined it right from day one and been fully supported, we would not have had the same kind of relationship and role and leadership that we had in the ICTY and the ICTR context. So in some sense, it's kind of a straw man to say, because we're not there, we don't have the influence we had. Well, we, wouldn't, we, we never would have in quite the same way. Um, I do take the point particularly on the proofing rule, for students who don't know, by definition, that means you can't talk to your witness before you put them on the stand. Don't try that in Georgia. I promise you. That's malpractice of the highest order. And so, should we be shocked when the first witness in the Lubanga case sits there and just is completely out of bounds? And should we be shocked that, just, or that, that, that victims around the world look at this process and say, hey, that's not what I thought was going on, okay? So, but, but I'm a pragmatist at heart, Diane. The circumstances may change down the line when two things can happen. One, we really can have a good faith dialogue on how to, how to reform the Rome Statute or to amend it in a way that really does address the underlying American concerns. And let me just give you one example. I mean, it's easy, it's oh so easy to poo-poo, and I've done it. Those, those, those rabid people out there who don't understand the court, who just think it's bad, take the separation of powers point, okay? Uh, the point that Charles made earlier. Which is, supreme, which is superior, the Article 98 textual obligation that says that sovereign immunity is preserved even in the face of the court, or Article 16? If you read the Chad Malawi opinion that was referenced earlier, even a first-year law student will read it and say, well, this isn't very persuasive. This is a group of judges just kind of giving a very self-fulfilling self, and there's no separation of powers prop problem here. There's no superiority of institutions that definitively says this is the rule of law, unless we take it to the ICJ and get a definitive resolution on that. But the states would never allow that to happen. So there are some fundamental problems in the court. We ought to be able to have a really good faith dialogue on how to, how to reform the statute. We can't have that dialogue, and until we can have that dialogue, I don't see how we get to the point that we can in good conscience really markedly take the political risk of really spending all of our capital on ratification. So does that mean we just sit back and we say, well, sorry, we can't do anything and we don't care about these norms? No, I say in the however long it takes, fill in the blank until we can get there, there's a huge amount of things that we can do and that we should be doing. And that the, the perfect is never the enemy of the good. And, and let's, be, let's be fair, let's be cynical. I mean, I'm not a cynic by nature, do you really think people sit around in the court, and I've been there lots of times, do they really sit around and saying, we wish we had more American expertise, more Americans that would work 20-hour days, 
Uh, we really wish we had more common lawyers to explain to us how to treat witnesses. No, they don't do that. Now, they love that when it happens, mind you. They love the expertise. What do they really want at the end of the day? Big, fat, appropriated paychecks so that they can move out of a zero-growth budget. I think that's one of the great crimes, really, of this whole era. If you polled people in the Rome negotiations, what will the structure of the court look like what will the, 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 the physical infrastructure of the Office of the Prosecutor look like after a decade of existence? People would be shocked at how overwhelmed they are and how outworked they are, which is why I get back to one of my themes. The answer to that lies not in U.S. ratification, but in a more effective synergy with domestic systems, a more good faith dialogue for how to really create this system. We're a long ways from being where we thought we'd be. We've got a lot of work to do that doesn't require or doesn't involve U.S. ratification. And that's where the pragmatist in me says, let's do what we can do now. Let's not sit and say, what comes later? Okay, we've got time for a couple more quick questions. My perspective can be easily captured, not in the public forum, but in the book chapter I just wrote for Karsten Stein. Coming out in Cambridge this month, if you want the link, I can send it to you. Essentially, Article 53, for those who don't know, and you reference this in your talk, but you didn't really have time to explain it. Um, Article 53 of the statute says that investigation can be deferred when it's in the interest of justice. That's the phrase. So the prosecutor, uh, uh, Luis Moreno Campo, said, I define the interest of justice as not being caving to the political expediency of the moment, meaning I'm a prosecutor, I do cases, you bring me the evidence, I'm going to try the case, irrespective of all the external political expediency and the political pressures. Now that's fine, but if you're looking for an intellect, the way I said it is an intellectually consistent, analytically defensible, what does the interest of justice really mean, you know, whether it's gachacha, or um, Matuaput in Uganda, or uh, the, the local tribal council in Afghanistan, which is the state party that has given the victims restitution, I guarantee you that a local mechanism, even run by a YMCA leader, is going to be a whole lot more effective at making a victim feel listened to and repaid than two decades worth of ICC litigation. And shouldn't the victims have a voice in what they prefer? Article 90, Article 53 doesn't even give the victims a voice in that prosecutor, that effort, that decision, what do we think is in the interest of justice? So it's Article 53 is the issue you're alluding to. Um, and the short answer is, I think that Fatu has a window to take the, the, uh, the prosecutor's Article 53 policy, which currently all it says is, this is what Article 53 is not. I think she's got the window to say, this is what Article 53 is. And to the extent that she doesn't do it, Anytime they make reference to Article 53, they're going to be accused of political pressure, ad hocery, caving to this victim group or that victim group, and more importantly, they're going to be accused of covering up the crimes of a particular sect or a particular crime or a particular country. They want to avoid that. And the way to avoid that is with an affirmative policy. What does Article 53 actually mean? as a matter of OTP policy. That's my two cents worth, and I wrote a whole book chapter on that. Last question. Let me just leave you with the soundbite, that, and I really believe this. We are doing a whole lot. Don't let anybody ever tell you that the United States has this hands-off, the ICC is a four-letter word. It's not, of course. It's a three-letter three acronym. And we don't do anything about it, and it's a dirty one. No, we're doing a whole lot. But I think we can do more. The burdens or the obstacles do not come really from American unwillingness to help. They come from the inability of our own bureaucratic structure to be clearly aligned. We are all on the same team, whether we're talking about the DCI or the Defense Intelligence Agency or some sub-bureau of the Pentagon or the State Department, or the Human Rights Bureau at the State Department, or Homeland Security. We are on the same team. And therefore, we should speak with one unified voice and, and do 
what Americans do, which is to be flexible, to be creative, to be pragmatic, and to do. If there's anything that America is known for, it's just that. It's doing. And the reasons we can't do right now have more to do with our own self-imposed limitations than they do with any other factor. And that's why I've tried to identify for you five key things that we can do and should do more effectively. Thank you for your time and thank you more importantly for staying awake.